when you're talking about your story towards success, there are always setbacks, but in a way, there are also building blocks. The challenges that people are facing at work. There's people who don't have hope either where they are going next, what is the career progression for them, is this career good for me, you know. I would meet managers who are saying, my employees are not motivated, you know. They are not committed. Those are the kind of conversations I was having, people who are frustrated with their work. So that intrigued me and almost, I think, changed the direction of the research that I was thinking about. This does not only work for leaders. I think this could work for cops, could work for engineers, teachers. So the way to become the best teacher is to become yourself. But you're yourself already. How do you become again? What does it mean even to become yourself? Do you mean you lost yourself somewhere in the process? What is it that I'm actually looking for? Do we really know life? Sure. But let me say intelligence. Emotional intelligence, social intelligence, financial intelligence. So I believe it's important for each and every one of us to understand the rules that govern any arena of your life. You are listening to The Revenge of the Forsaken Gods, a podcast that explores the human experience and seeks to create a blueprint for living using books, stories, movies, and conversations. And here is your host, Andrew Balongo Opere. Are you an organization who is dealing with low engagement, low productivity, and lack of motivation? Are you an employee that hates your job, your boss, or yourself, and resigning is not an option? Do you have money, power, and fame? but you're still yearning for something that you fully cannot grasp? Welcome to Revenge of the Forsaken Gods podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Balongo Perry, and I have an individual who seeks to answer these questions. He has a bachelor in physics, a master's in human resource management, and a doctorate in business administration, specializing in leadership and organizational change. And through his experiences, He says he has the answers to all of these questions. He also has been having his own consultancy of Kome Business Consultants since 2018. And he mainly serves medium-sized companies. And he's been consulting ever since 2010, having a background in banking, HR, leadership training, and strategic planning. And an interesting thing about him is he mentors and he loves writing study materials for for discipleship. And apart from that, he's an avid soccer fan and he's a staunch Arsenal supporter since 2001. And his message to us is enough is enough. People cannot be having these problems. It's time to do something about it. Without further ado, let us welcome the great Dr. Emmanuel Mango. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It is a pleasure to be here. So so let's get things straight first. You said enough is enough. Yes. Uh, why is it that you're a staunch Arsenal supporter since 2001? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I think 2001 was the year I was in campus, one of the years I was in campus. And um, <clears throat> actually, I will go back. It is the year I was going go, going to campus. I was going the following year because I joined campus in 2002. Uh, so 2001, I happened to watch some clips of uh, the EPL, that is the English Premier League. And I would look at African prayer, given that I'd watched some World Cup before and I'd watched some Africa Cup of Nations. So I was tracing the route, where do this African prayer go to play when they are not playing Africa Cup of Nations or they are not in the World Cup. So I happened to be following uh, Kanu, who was a Nigerian player at that point in time. And he happened to be playing for Arsenal. So uh, I followed him uh, to Arsenal. And since then, I've never left. I've been supporting Arsenal. Uh, through the years when we are invincible and some years of course we have been uh, not invincible (laughs) but we still uh, keep the fire burning yes yes Mm. so yes we have your book out the the good success how to cultivate fulfilling impactful and value-driven life what was the inspiration for for writing this book how did it come to be 
Wonderful. So thank you, Andrew, for asking this question because uh, um, I also thought about this. Uh, where did, you, did we begin this journey? Uh, according to me, this writing of this book, it does not happen the, uh, just in the last four years when I actually put the uh, pen to paper, but this book has been written over years. So I'll take you back. As a young man, I've been uh, fascinated. As a young man then, I was fascinated by many uh, 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 great minds and people who are achieving success. Um, a, a case in point, I would, I would name, uh, say, uh, George Orwell of the Animal Farm. Um, I read that book as a young man and I was fascinated by not, uh, not much of the story but much of the writer of the story. I looked at him as a person who is representing a certain voice. So I, want, I was asking myself, how do you get to a level where you are representing a certain group of people being able to articulate their issues so that they get to be heard? Mm -hmm. So that's what I was looking at at that point when I read that book. Um, and I think my first inspirations as a young man came mostly from book. I would remember the biograph of some writers, mostly of them are Ingl English writers. There was George Bernard Shaw that I looked at his uh, uh, biography. I think it was written by a name by a person called Pearson, but I need to confirm. So, so those were the initial influences. But from that stage, the one thing that I would see as a thread that has linked to this book is I wanted to help people to become greater and that fire has kept burning in me. How do I help people to think, become, or do greater things? Um, um, Later on, of course, you'll see as we'll be talking that that has been modified and crafted. Mm -hmm. But the, that, there is that linkage of asking myself, how do I help people to do greater things? So okay. that was my thinking as a child. Um, so again, I would um, say that the journey to writing this book, because we are trying to say, how do we get to this level until we have a book? It was not a straightforward. It was not that cut. Uh, it was not a straight path that uh, I knew my purpose. I wanted to to make uh, to help people think and do great things, uh, have a purpose in life. No, um, I was also consumed in the normal things of life. But from time to time, there was this ember of trying to uh, get to a level where I can also offer my contribution. I remember mm -hmm. in class seven, particularly our class teacher, uh, one of the teachers, not the class teacher, asked us in class, what do we want to be when we grow up? I said, uh, 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 myself, I said I wanted to be a politician. And everybody in class laughed. No, they were amused. Um, so I learned later why they were amused. It's because politicians, at least in those times, I don't know now, I think even now, they used to be uh, um, people with low educations and they were known mostly for doing nothing. So that's why everybody was amused why I wanted to be a politician. And my, and my, my teacher actually said, you know, if you want to be a politician, you're wasting your time in class. You, 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 you better go to the streets and start uh, finding out how to, do people become politicians. But... The, what was burning in me then to be a politician was not because I wanted a, a, um, a position. I wanted a place where I can serve. I thought that was one of the greatest influences uh, that can be there in a society as a platform for service. I thought that was the biggest platform that is there to serve people, serve more people, serve them better. So that's why I was thinking of a politician. But mm -hmm. um, that has a, maybe, I went on and I remember when I was in campus uh, at that point in time, um, <clears throat> I was very good in sciences. 
So, and then there was this uh, uh, awakening in the society that uh, sciences are very good. Everybody should become a scientist. And because I was good in science, I thought, why, should, why shouldn't I pursue, uh, when I get to the, uh, to the university, why shouldn't I pursue a degree uh, in science? And particularly, I thought engineering was a good one because I thought engineers, again, solve problems. Uh, human problems. Um, however, I didn't qualify for direct entry into the engineering uh, 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 course. So I said I was not giving up because that was one of the characters and that because I'd been reading uh, books of people who had done great things and I knew that one of the things you don't do is you don't give up. So I kept moving and said, okay, even if I've not qualified to do an engineering course, I'm still going to do this engineering at some point. So I decided to take on mathematics and physics as my bachelor's of, of science. However, uh, in my second year, uh, uh, things were not adding up. Uh, despite the fact that I'd been very good at physics and maths, I started, things were not adding up. And I think for many reasons, one of the reasons is which I discovered later, that that was not my area of calling. But I was, because I was good at it, I thought I should pursue it. Just like so many other people I've seen around, if you are good at something, you tend to think this is what I should do. So uh, the other reason why I think in, uh, mathematics and physics started to become challenging is because I was spending most of my time in the main library at the University of Nairobi. I was looking at, I was reading books by Martin Luther reading the revolution, the civil rights movement, and I was fascinated by uh, what he was doing with the leading the blacks. I was, uh, I was reading, I think I came across one book by Mwalim Julius Nyerere again, and I was fascinated how he led the people. So I was looking at all this, in as much as I was attracted to, to the liberation literature, I was not looking at myself as moving into that direction of liberation, but I was fascinated with, it was a medium to help me see that if, if you love an area and you are called in a certain area, you can cause impact in that area. So I was searching for my area while I was reading the literatures of those uh, great leaders because I was also fascinated by their stories. So um, years later, I finished, um, I finished my degree in physics and, uh, and mathematics despite the challenges that I had with the studies at some point. Um, but I'd already set my eyes on what I'd, had, I'd asked people around and said, if you want to be a trainer, what course do you take? And somebody advised me, I remember a gentleman visited campus. I can't remember their name, but one of the visitors that come to the universities. And after his talk, he had given a talk, I went and asked him, if you want to be a person who develop others and help them succeed in their career, what course do you do? Then he told me, there is nothing close to that, but something that can help in that line would be human resource. Not perfect, but you can get some ideas. So by the time I was finishing my undergraduate degree, then I moved on to start asking uh, around how do I get into the human space, human resource space. So I, um, I went to Kim, Kenya Institute of Management. I enrolled in a diploma course for six months, uh, for a year, it was a year. So I did a diploma in human resource and it gave me some ideas on how to help people at workplace. So that's how I transitioned from the physical sciences to the human sciences through to the uh, to yeah to the human sciences through or social sciences through human resource. And that was interesting for me, but I still needed to bridge. And these are some of the when you're talking about your story towards success, they are always uh how do I call them? Are, are they like setbacks? You can you can call them setbacks, but in a way they are also building blocks. I remember um, I needed some finances to bridge. I wouldn't get a job in HR straight. So I got a job in the uh, in banking sector. And uh, there were traps of banking because, you see, uh, good pay at the bank. Um, uh, so I, I was now asking myself, am I going to go back to that career 
of helping people move forward and become better? Or do I pursue a career in the banking, which came with a good package at that point in time? And I think at that point, the good thing I was focused, although I didn't know exactly what I'm going to do in the human space, but I knew banking was not one of, was not one of the things I wanted to do for a long time. Uh, and the evidence for that I remember is um, one of the things when you get to the banking sector, there are loans that are given to people. You know, you can get a loan at a very low interest rate. But I remember saying my, to myself, if I give, ever get one of these loans, there is no way I'm going to get out of this banking industry. So I said I would not take one of these loans because this is not my home. There is a place I'm going, despite the fact that I took a detour to pass through the banking area. So, um, so I, I, I worked there for about two years and a half. Then um, a firm, the, uh, there is a gentleman who had visited campus. Many years when I was still in campus, he had come to give us a talk. And it's important to mention this because, again, one of the talks that person presented in the talk, he gave us the link to the video that Steve Jobs had just done at that point at Stanford, commencement address, uh, um, um, which is a famous commencement address in the world to date. Um, and in that speech, I remember many things. One of the things is uh, Steve Jobs kept on saying, find what you like to do. Um, and that was always in my mind. So this gentleman, Going through the, I don't know if it was on social media or website, I saw they were advertising for a position. So I applied for that position. Um, and when I applied for that position, I looked at the salary they were paying me at that point. One of the things that I looked at, it was 40% uh, less than what I was getting at the bank. Nearly, almost a half past, almost a half. But I, I reflected, I thought about... Um, do I stay here in the banking area and continue with the salaries that I was earning or do I jump the ship and go to this small SME where they're paying me half of what I'm earning um, so that I pursue my dream, which I was not even very clear exactly what it was. But I thought in that space of human resource consulting, it was near to what I want. So I made that decision and I left uh, employment. And I think that time uh, um, I was also dating uh, the lady who became my wife. And I remember we, we, <laughs> we, we had a fight a bit, uh, whether we, <laughs> because we were planning a wedding. And here I was taking a pay cut, half, half of what I was earning. But we, we, we managed to sort out because uh, I would say that um, a purpose was calling despite the, the, the challenges that are there. So uh, I, jumped, uh, I jumped from banking, I went into management consulting, this is 2010, um, trying to figure out within this space, how do I get to the space where I'm, I'm able to help people become better and more? You know, that was like always the thing that was driving me behind the scene. So um, I worked in that job, did um, uh, training, uh, did uh, HR consulting. I started interacting with employees in various organizations. One of the things I like about consulting is that you meet people from diverse orga organizations. So you get to hear. So I, got to, I, I, I started now realizing the challenges that people are facing at work. Part of those challenges I saw hopelessness, people who don't have hope either where they are going next, what is the career progression for them, is, is this career good for me? You know, I experienced it through the discussions I was having with employees within those circles. I would meet managers who are saying, my employees are not motivated, you know, they are not committed. Why, what is the education system doing to us? Why is the education system sending people who are not committed to work. You know, those are the kind of conversations I was having. So I was experiencing frustrations. People who 
who are frustrated with their work. So all these things were now running in my mind. I was asking myself, what do I do about it? I thought I would do HR to help them be better and do more. But HR is not the final ultimate solution and it's not helping us to get there. Still there was, you have these good ideas, but you still have to take them to management for approval and some of those, most of those uh, uh, proposals that you would take to management, you'd find that the management is either finding them expensive or they don't see the direct linkage on how they are going to make money through those activities. And so I, I was again back onto that journey. HR has not solved these problems that I thought they were going to be solved, but at least I've gotten some better understanding of the challenges we people are facing faster and being there as their HR, being there also as a person who wants them to be more and better. So I was now getting clearer. But again, something was running in my mind as saying, this looks like there are symptoms. This looks like there are symptoms. The lack of motivation, the lack of commitment, the dissatisfactions, um, low productivity and low disengagement. They all looked to me like they are symptoms. So I was still asking myself, what is the mother <clears throat> of all these problems? Where do these problems come from? So um, I continued with HR for, for a while. Um, but I decided to change the employer. So I moved to the next employer. So when I moved to the next employer, I had an opportunity to do more than an HR. So I started now having an opportunity to engage at a, pl a bigger platform. So at this uh, bigger platform, I would do, uh, yes, the HR aspect. I would do uh, recruitment. I would do trainings. I would do... Um, strategic planning, which was became the key things that I started doing at that second employer, strategic planning. So now this gave me a, a bigger platform because within strategic planning, strategy belongs to the board, to the board members. So I was now sitting with the board members. I was sitting with the top management discussing the direction where the companies are going. So I thought maybe once I'm seated there, I could be able to find answers. To, and be able to solve the problems of these employees. Um, so I was fascinated to be at the, the big table now, um, uh, discussing the, the roadmap. So um, um, I did discuss that, but what I quickly also discovered that a number of strategic plans, quite a high number of strategic plans, don't get implemented. Um, two, Within those strategic plan making table, again, people are looking at profitability mostly as the key element to be included into the strategic plan, productivities. And, and so I was saying again, there is a limitations here, but I was, I was trying to see what is the disconnect. Because but what is the limitation of viewing mm. strategic output through the eyes of productivity and profitability? I think on one hand it's not a problem, but if it is the only eyes that you are look using to view that strategic plan, that's where the problem is. Because on one hand, they would they should be that productivity because without it you are going to shut up. But they are the people who are working and producing and the people you want them to be productive in these organizations. Have you given them the conducive environment. Yes, some organization did. And that was also good for me because I saw some people who are working in very good organizations where the management had provided what they could offer. That could be pay rise, benefits, and a conducive environment where managers were good people and promoted uh, a, a good culture within an organization. But still, I was facing with people who were asking themselves, is this what we were meant to do? Are we at the right place? Are we causing the impact that we should cause? So that notwithstanding that they are earning high, they are in a good environment, 
but there was still that element. So it was still puzzling for me also because I thought that if people have been offered, have been paid well, they have been treated well, then they should work as hard as possible. They should be happy and reciprocate by working hard. But there was still some element, and I think that's why I was saying that all these things began to look to me as, as if they are symptoms. symptoms rather than the real problem. So I was interested in finding out what is this real problem. One of the reasons, and I think we may discount this physics as a detour that I took in life, but one of the things that I learned from physics is the element of the first principle. So the element of the first principle helps you to analyze among the drivers which one is essential critical. So first principle goes to that and say what are if if we are to take the five elements, key elements that are that you can't do away with, you can't do without, what would that be? So that's what physics teaches us. So I now, I was now thinking about that. I was thinking, okay, uh, benefits are good. Uh, working environment, good working environment is good. Payment, uh, good pay is good. But it is not all. So why, what is all? What is, what is it? What is the... Is it that is lacking in this equation? The, the, the picture is beginning to form, but what is lacking in this equation? So I'd, um, I'd also, in the process, started uh, having ideas of going back to school. You remember I'd finished, it, I'd finished my diploma? Your diploma, yes. I'd also done my master's, which I'd not mentioned, still within HR. I'd completed, but I thought then the key drivers of organizational fulfillment and people being happy within organization, and by extension the society because everybody works somewhere, whether self-employed or not, was leadership. So I'd started developing ideas about leadership. So I said, let me go to university uh, for the third time now, <laughs> trying to understand um, uh, leadership. Because I thought that is the missing element uh, from the analysis that I'd, I'd, I'd achieved up to that point. I thought it's leadership element that is going to get us to Canaan. So I went to do my doctorate at USIU uh, in leadership and organizational change. And I, I think I've written somewhere that no sooner, no sooner had I reached the top than I began to, to, to think that the, the answer is actually not here. It lies somewhere else. But at least I had gotten to the top now. I had no excuse to say that maybe if I take another step up, I would be able to have a better view. You know, you see, I'd been to the top, at least academic ladder had climbed to the top. And so, and I was also interacting with board members during strategy. But so I was, but I would still the picture for me of solving that aspect of helping people be better and more was not complete. There was still missing element. So I started reading and one of the things that um, uh, I, I continued reading and one of the things that is pivotal that emerged at that point, which has a direct link to this book we are discussing today, was the element that I came up with uh, an idea of writing a paper, which I, I wanted to call how to select, develop, and maintain effective leaders. So I thought in that paper, I'm going to give a blueprint of how to select, develop, and maintain effective leaders. So I thought that's where I'm going now to, to give the recipe or the elements to reveal how you, you do that. Because I thought if we do it for leaders, then we will use that template to say how do you select, develop, uh, develop and maintain effective teachers, effective cops, effective engineers. So I was now looking at that as going to be the template. So within that 
while I was doing that initial research, I came across uh, a quote uh, by uh, then the top uh, regarded teacher of leaders called Warren, uh, Warren Benz. Ben, Benz Warren, or vice versa. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, and he said, the question he was, he asked, he was asked a question, how do you, how do you grow effective leaders? Or how do people become good leaders? And he said, the only way to become a good or better leader is to become yourself. I said, okay. That's how you become a better, a good leader, is to become yourself. Like, it sounded simple. Why did I go to do the, the PhD, you know? <laughs> for, for me to get to that point. Yes, yes. You know, you know, and I was like, okay, this does not only work for leaders. I think this could work for cops, could work for engineers, teachers. So the way to become the best teacher is to become yourself. But you're yourself already. How do you become again? Does it mean, how, what does it mean even to become yourself? Do you mean you lost yourself somewhere in the process of growing up or going through the system of education? Did you lose, where did you lose yourself that you need to become yourself for you to become a leader? So, 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 so that intrigued me and, and almost I think changed the direction of the research that I was thinking about because I was only thinking about how to become a better leader. How do you grow? How do you select, develop, and maintain effective leaders? Now my goal was, my eyes were opening. How do you select, develop better teachers? How do you select, develop better uh, media personnel like Andrew here? You know, how do you get the best of them? You know, how do you empower them? So that, that so, so, so now, I was not looking as leaders and that was now tapping into my interest because now it was becoming, I'd always, as I'd said before, I wanted to make people better and do more, you know, do more and become better. So I saw pursuing leadership per se alone was not where I should go. I should look at something that bring together all these lessons that I've learned over years, knowingly and unknowingly, mostly unknowingly. <laughs> because it's not like a straight line, you know, I went even into physics, banking, and so on. But in a way, when you look back, you can be able to connect the, the, the dots. And so I started thinking, I remember there are two key questions that um, uh, uh, came to my mind at that point again. Because now I was in that framework. One of the questions is, what is the best use of life? I don't know if you have ever, uh, Andrew, have you ever reflected on what is the best use of life? Who thinks about that? Like, <laughs> I don't think I've thought about what is the best use of life, but mm. I've asked, like, what's life all about? Uh -huh. what, what, what do you do with this life that I have? And I have these skills, but how to use them is not mm. really obvious. Okay. Yeah. So when you read the book and you'll find a place where I've said, I've asked, mm -hmm. what was life seeking from, what is life seeking from you? You know, we go at life from the angle, what am I seeking from life? You know, I want a car, I want a, a house, you know, I want a big mansion yeah. uh, at, near the beach. You know, that's what you want from life. But do you get to a point where you're asking yourself, what does life want from me? I guess no one really asks that question, you know, especially in the African setup. Maybe, maybe not. Yes. What does life want from me? Um, I know that there are things I want from life, but what does life want from me? <laughs> that's a powerful question. I think maybe people... From what of I, I I think about is people synonymously put 
life and God in the same sentence? What does God want me to do with my life to on this planet Earth? Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think that could be also a good question because then it begins to bring you to a place of service rather than a place of people should serve you, offer you the big, big house near the beach. You know, what does life want from me? So life is asking us from us. So the, the two questions that was came up, that, that was a spin-off of the first question of um, what is the best use of life. So that's how I came to that spin-off of what does life want from me. But then the other question that um, was around that area is uh, what is it truly that human beings are searching for? What is it truly that human beings are searching for? Because I put the word there truly, because everybody everybody can answer the question, what are human beings searching for? They are searching for a house, they are searching for a big pay, they are searching for uh, status, love, you know. But what is it truly human beings are searching for? Because I'd seen, I'd seen, I'd been to a place where people are employed, they are earning good salary, they have good cars, they're driving big cars, which is good. But still those guys were miserable. <clears throat> so then it requires us now to go deep and start asking deep questions, like what does life want from me? Otherwise, then the solutions that we are going to be having are going to be superficial. If we don't get to that deeper level of asking and questioning, so that we now start solving problems at that deeper level. Otherwise, we'll remain at the managemental level, management, uh, managerial level, where you are looking at the best way to motivate employees, pay them better, give them good allowance, benefits, no, those, those are good. But people who have those are still looking for something. What is this something? True. And now, okay, then what is the difference between what you are calling good success and then what is it the difference between traditional success? Mm-hmm. How do you define good success and traditional success and what's the difference between the two? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So, so in the book, I lay out um, the differentiation between these two types of success. Perhaps I would give a note even before I talk about the difference. Why are we talking about success? I think the reason why I drew myself to the topic, especially the word success, is because we all look for it. We just call it differently. You want your kids to succeed. You want them to be better, do better, learn more. What is that learning more, being better? What is that? That could be termed as success. You want to earn more. You want, even if you are in NGO and a government organization space, you want to impact more people. You want to serve more people. What's that? We can have a single name and say that's a lev- that is success. So that's why we are talking about this word, success. We want it, but because it has been abused, not only abused, but it has been framed in a way, one, it is difficult to attain, two, <clears throat> There are people who have attempted to offer solutions on how to get it, which is the, the, the industry of motivation, the, the motivation speakers, writers, you know, it's a whole industry. So because they have offered solutions for a long time and those solutions have not taken us to Canaan, then we think, one, this success business is a bad business. That is, uh, success in itself, one, is fake. It, it, it's, 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 it's not there. It's a fad. Or we can't attain it. 
all there is nobody who knows how to get it so that's why i still wanted to get back to this word success and say we all need it we all want it but is this success that we need can it be defined differently that it brings us satisfaction that does not only brings us satisfaction but brings satisfaction to the people around us the people in our audience or the people we serve so that's that's the way first i looked at success because everybody needs it and wants it despite the the challenges around it then secondly i said we need to reclaim success we need to baptize it we need in a way we need to own it we need to rename it so that it is something positive we all want to achieve <clears throat> so that's why we then came up with a good success to distinguish it from all other success which i call traditional success so what is the good success so the good success have in a way put it to have three elements so the first element is impact why why impact being the first success, uh, the first element because from my analysis reading books looking at people who have succeeded and those who have succeeded and are happy and they enjoying themselves they have been impactful they have served others you can't go wrong serving others so we are talking about success that is causing an impact success that is a result of serving others i want to challenge our listeners here to name for me a person who has gone out of his way been committed who has given his all to serve others and yet is not happy about it he might have received even jesus was hanged by serving others it doesn't mean that serving others is simple easy that's not what we are talking about that you not face challenges but we are saying are you fulfilled correct are you happy while doing it that's what i'm talking about i'm not talking about that serving others is a, is a, is a bed of roses you know there is thorns in today so 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 success to me that is good is first built on that element of service says that is good has a level of fulfillment <clears throat> that you are not just going to serve others you must enjoy doing it for two reasons one that's how you are going to do it for a long time if you are not fulfilled there is very high likelihood that that service is not going to last when you meet obstacles when it is 4 am and you receive a call from the patient that you need to report at the to the hospital to see a doc a, a patient that is the moment now you are going to say i need to find a different career because it you find it is hard to 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 pursue success but if it fulfills you it energizes you you like it it motivates you you are going to be at it you receive a call at 4 go to the hospital attend to the patient attend to the next one and go home fulfilled feeling that you made an impact you did something so i'm looking at people not just succeeding but being happy as they succeed and staying happy in that success but i use the word fulfillment rather than happiness because happiness also is fleeting but fulfillment you might be the patient that you are trying to help may not be happy with you may even call your names <laughs> <laughs> but if that's your calling you are going to stick there you are going to see the next patient but if that is something your dad told you that you must do a course in medicine you are going to go back that evening and say to hell with it 
I'm not going to go to hospital again. After all, the people I'm helping, they're not even appreciating. You know. So that's why the, the element for me of fulfillment is top notch. That you're not only causing an impact, you are also being fulfilled. You like it, you love it. So the third aspect is, and I say, these are some of the questions that I ask in the book. You may ask, there are three critical questions. The first question you'll ask yourself, have I been impactful? Have I been fulfilled? The third question you should ask, did I do it right? And there we need to pause. Did I do it right? Because you can be impactful, you can steal one million from someone and go give it to the poor in a way you have been impactful. But did you do it right? Well, that's a powerful question. I don't get to hear that being asked of success or in a definition of success. Yeah. Did I do it right? So I want us to get that level where you can say, I impacted a million people. I was fulfilled and I did it right. Okay. <clears throat> and and, and you've, you've defined for us what you have defined as the good success, which is impactful, fulfillment, and doing it right. Yeah. And how is this different from the traditional success? How is traditional success defined? Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. So the metrics of uh, success, and I've said in the book, you know, there are some people who say that uh, success is not defined. But when I looked through literature and even just the lips of people speaking, you find that success has a definition. But that definition is the traditional definition of success. So people look at success by the level of wealth that you have accumulated. So money is one of the metrics of success. The second element, um, the second metric of, of uh, success is status. Are you, who are you in the society? <clears throat> then the final one is power. And that's why you see uh, around this society of ours, uh, people are doing anything and everything to become leaders in the society because they know once you have power, you can be able to use it the way you want. And that's why we call people with power Mweshmiwa. I don't know why. You know, power gives you, you already, by just being a politician, you have become respected. You know, <laughs> we call them Mweshmiwa, you know. <laughs> yeah, why don't we call teachers Mweshmiwa, you know, teachers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Mm -hmm. it's, why don't we call doctors Mweshmiwa, you know? They're doing a good job. They're doing not just a good job. I don't know how to even to describe it. They, they are doing God's work, teachers and doctors. But we don't call them Mweshmiwa. So we want the power is, is something else. And I remember a quote which says that power tires those who don't have it. You know, that's why... Uh, uh, you, you wonder why some politicians stay in power for so long because you have never tested it. Once you test it, you'll know why you want to stay there. But here I digress. So I want to stick to that definition that the traditional success is power, money, and status. So that's what many people have been pursuing. But the, the problem is, is that you, we have seen people who have attained it and get, got into depression. So that's why it is not a solution. You can have all the money, but you miss. You, you, while you're pursuing all this money you missed to attend to your children's birthdays, so you end up with a, a, a bank full of cash and children who don't want to talk to you. We have seen in this country where billionaires, at least one or two, have died. And their children have said they don't want to be part of that inheritance. If you read wide, you can be able to find out. <laughs> I will not name names. But they have said they don't want to be part of that inheritance because that third question, did I do it right? 
Wow, that, that's very interesting. And uh, yeah, what I find that even though you've laid out this case of the difference between traditional and uh, good success, you've not just left it there. You've provided a framework. And before we get into the framework, I'd like us to take a small break so that after we come back from the break, we will now explore this framework that can help us start to practice what you call the good success, which is the combination of impact, fulfillment, and doing it right or filled with virtues. Thank you, Andrew. All Looking right. forward. Thank you for tuning in to the Revenge of the Forsaken Gods podcast. This is the end of part one. I hope you have had a fulfilling, impactful, and value-driven listening or watching experience. If you have heard at least one idea that has challenged the way you're thinking or even added a new way to how you look at life, I would love to hear your feedback. Please do share in the comments section below or any of my social media handles at RevengeFGods. Stay tuned for part two next week. So until then, have an impactful, fulfilling and value-driven week.